Thank you everyone for coming. Welcome to the Distinguished Writers Series with Karen Russell, um, Claire Massoud, one of our English faculty members and a wonderful novelist, is going to introduce Karen, then um, she's going to read a bit, then there's going to be a QA, and a and afterwards you can buy books at the book table at the back and Karen will sign them up here if you wanted to. And without further ado, please welcome Claire Massoud. Thank you, Gabriel. Wow. Oh, it moves. Look, you can have you can have like action as well as everything else. It's a it's a huge pleasure uh, for all of us to welcome Karen Russell, a writer of prodigious talent, human wisdom and generosity, exuberant inventiveness, delicious wit, and scintillating sentences. What more could a reader want? Although she's not yet 35, Karen is one of the most laureled writers around. Uh, thank goodness the laurels aren't made of gems or like the Queen of England in her crown. Karen couldn't possibly bear their weight. Originally from Florida, she graduated from the Columbia University MFA in 2006, but the blink of an eye ago. Uh, and her first acclaimed short story collection, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Raised by Wolves, was published in 2007. Her best-selling debut novel, Swamplandia, came out in 2011. Named one of the New York Times best books of, 2000, of that year, it was a finalist for the 2012 Pulitzer Prize and garnered the 2012 New York Public Library Young Lions Award. She was a fellow at the American Academy in Berlin in 2012, and she was awarded a MacArthur Genius Grant in 2013. And I, I was thinking before I um, met her that it must be really tough to be Karen because she has no excuse to complain about anything. So <laughs> when, you need, when you need a little sympathy, what do you say to your friends? That MacArthur money doesn't stretch as far as I thought it would. Or I feel positively ancient. I'll be turning 35 next year. I'm running out of time. And instead of, instead of hugs and flowers, you get basilisk stares and rank hostility. It's, it's really tough. Um, Karen's most recent works are her 2013 short story collection, Vampires in the Lemon Grove, and her 2014 novella, Sleep Donation, which is published by our extended family member, Frances Cody, at Atavist. If you haven't yet had the joy of discovering Karen's work, and if Ava Bigtree, her siblings, Aussie and Kiwi, and their crumbling alligator theme park in the Florida Everglades, Swamplandia, are not yet part of your internalized world, then I recommend you embark as soon as possible on that literary journey. But in the first instance, you can discover the spooky, unsettling, unforgettable worlds of her short stories. Part Poe, part Kafka, part Lewis Carroll, and entirely her own. Whether you're listening to the tale of Kitsune, the young Japanese woman in the 19th century who's turning into a silkworm in Reeling for the Empire, or to the plight of her rough contemporary Miles Zegner in Proving Up, the pioneer boy who must ride his horse to the nearest neighbors in order to take them the region's one shared glass window before the government inspector arrives and will encounter much more than he bargained for along the way. Or Beverly, the massage therapist, tending to a tattooed Iraq war veteran who comes to wonder whether memories can be altered by the touch of her hands. You have only to enter once into Karen Russell's imagination to realize that like Doctor Who's TARDIS, it is infinitely more capacious and vivid than you could have thought possible. You will trust Karen Russell, indeed, to take you anywhere. So let's go. Thank you, Karen. That's just outrageous. Thank you so much, Claire. I can't even believe, if Claire had said, like, I read these stories and loathed them, I would still feel so complimented, because that's like, that is like the equivalent of getting just, you know, beachfront real estate. I they can't, you know, it, thank you guys for reading those stories to um, the students I met today. That means so much to me. Um, and it's so cool to get to be a part of this series. Um, I said, I want the t-shirt. <laughs> I'm really proud. Um, and thanks for coming out on a weeknight um, when I know there's truly so much going on and it's getting kind of close to the end of the semester. I'm just going to set a timer so I don't go into a fugue state and that's always my fear. You know, like the sun will be coming up and you'll all be dead and <laughs> let's see, I'll have no idea. Because um, I think we've all, we've all been at that kind of a reading, <laughs> um, if we're honest. Um, 
Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. It is a true joy. I want to just embarrass Claire one more time. When I was an undergrad, I did, we could do these sort of thesis presentations, and mine was on her unbelievable novella, The Hunters. So mercifully, you'll never see or hear me speak about that book as I was 18, and I think it was just a lot of exclamation point marginalia. Um, and then I couldn't even photocopy it for my own students because I was like, oh, this indicts me <laughs> as a fraud. Um, but it is, it's just, who, who, knew that, who knew that these joys were coming in this our only life? So um, I'm not sure where I'm going. I'll, I'll give your wedding toast someday. I, I don't know where that's going. We, let's not rule it out. Um, I, have, I never get to read from this novella that I did with extended family member Francis Cody, who is this most brilliant editor, um, and I think sort of a partner in crime with Peter Carey, who I know is a brilliant novelist and faculty here. So this was, I was having just a really hard time sleeping um, it's the most boring origin story, and I think I just wanted baby sleep badly. I just wanted the sleep of infants for this period where I was kind of going on just traveling a lot and sleeping in weird motels and completely incapable of, um, you know, getting more than a couple cut-up hours. And uh, so I was thinking, you know, what if there was some way that you could transfuse dreams to an insomniac? Wouldn't that be, you know, the best, the best thing ever? And it's such a kind of a dumb idea, but then this novella grew out of that. So I thought, I, I really haven't read from it much at all. And I, if it's okay with you, I'll read just a little bit. Sorry, I set this timer wrong, so I set it for two minutes. That won't do. One sec. <laughs> I just got panicked. I'm like, we have 17 seconds less. It's been a pleasure. Goodbye. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is, uh, can you guys hear me? I'm Confused. This has got some lynching in action up here, right there. Uh, yeah, this is called uh, Sleep Donation. The Sleep Van. The siren goes, and we code for dispatch. Nine times in 20 lately, it's the same address. 330 Cedar Ridge Parkway. Then we get a call back saying the dispatch is canceled. Then we get a third call. No, disregard the cancellation. Get a sleep van to the property. Stat. What's happening is revealed to us by a visibly distraught Jim. Mr. and Mrs. Harkonnen are having a dispute. Mr. Harkonnen says he wants us to drop out. So what, says the intern. We don't use his donations. No, jackass. He's trying to pull out with baby A. Everybody looks over at that. Rudy slaps his bald spot and leaves the hand there until a grapefruit hue spills underneath his fingers as if the scalp were blushing. Jim freezes in the center of the trailer in full view of every staffer and rubs his fists against his gray eyes. It is a pitiful and futile gesture to witness, like watching a hamster cower inside a plastic cage. We can see how terrified Jim is of losing both things, baby A and our good opinion of him. Six staffers are working the phones tonight and we are all mentally coaching him. Please don't cry, Jim. Our sleep station has an unusual top-heavy hierarchy. We have two supervisors, the Storch brothers, former CEOs who left the business world at the height of the insomnia crisis, who freely give their resources to the not-for-profit slumber corps. Money, time, intellect, leadership, creativity, toilet seats. The Storch has made their fortune in the ergonomic toilet business. You may have seen their advertisements. To shit upon a Storch feels better than a visit to your chiropractor. Their extreme altruism is a provocation to everyone on staff and inducement to work even harder, a reminder that we could always be giving more. Rudy and Jim have been, my, thank you, <laughs> Rudy and, I think it'd be a good advertisement. Rudy and Jim have been my supervisors for seven years. I was the first recruiter assigned to their team. I don't socialize with my bosses outside of work. Our contact is limited to this office unless you count public performances at the core fundraisers, the charity balls, and the charity golf-offs. But I know every shadow of my boss's faces, all of their stupid storchy tics, that upsetting thing Rudy does with pen caps, and what Jim's not saying at our meetings. These brothers are middle-aged Irish twins, clean-shaven and built like longshoremen. Externally, they have slate eyes and cranberry red hair balding in identical horseshoes. Internally, each brother has his own uniquely fucked emotional metabolism. Rudy, for example, is currently managing his despair by bawling out the interns, sweat jeweling all along his dusky face like a July whiskey glass. The Storches are celebrities in the sleep crisis community, 
Eight years ago, the brothers served on the inaugural Slumber Corps Board of Directors at headquarters in Washington, D.C. Within months, the Corps had established outposts in every major city, pululating, pululating, I think that's how you say that, green offshoots of the D.C. base. Soon, local branches began operating more or less independently, soliciting donations for money and sleep, whereupon the Storch Bros promptly requested a demotion to this low prestige placement in their home city, a solar zone assignment. We serve an urban core where the rate of insomnia is 22% higher than the national average. Our Pennsylvania city is one of the greatest REM deficits on the East Coast, although we are certainly not the worst hit. Tampa, riddlingly, currently leads the nation in new cases of the insomnia. The governor's budget cuts in that sunshine state have meant that Floridian sleep scientists remain stalled at the dang slash go figure stage of their research. Hundreds of our old neighbors, friends, coworkers, and teachers are new insomniacs. They file for dream bankruptcy, appeal for slumber core aid, wait to be approved for a sleep donor. It's a special kind of homelessness, says our mayor, to be evicted from your dreams. I believe our mayor is both genuinely concerned for his insomniac constituency and also pandering to a powerfully desperate new voting bloc. Currently, the NCEH is investigating possible environmental causes in our city, everything from the water table to disturbed eagle's nests to the brilliance of the moon on grass to the antique screams of the historic monorail. You know, I grew up here too. We operate out of a Moby office, six interlocking trailers dry docked on a vacant downtown lot which the Corps leases from the city. Rudy calls it the redneck labyrinth Labyrinth. I, I don't know how to say anything. Labyrinth. A former FEMA engineer designed it as a temporary accommodation, a base camp for local teams working at the frontiers of the crisis. We have been working out of our tin can for half a decade. Nobody suggests moving into a brick and mortar office. Nobody wants to peer through glass windows in a building with a foundation and admit that the insomnia emergency is now a permanent condition. You would think that it would be difficult to hide in a trailer. But I'm chameleon next to the phone wall near the black window. Some intern has made curtains for the trailer windows, snaggy lace, which look nothing like curtains in fact, but rather vestments tiny and obscene, bridal veils for mice, chinchilla negligees. They flutter in the trailer's manic air conditioning. Outside the moon is a colossus, and its radiance makes every white of human manufacture seem dingy and impure. I turn from the moon, remove the headset, I give myself one more blank moment. Where's Trish? Get Trish. I'm over here, I say. Edgewater, screams Rudy, there you are. We have a major goddamn problem. It's a hitch, soothes Jim. The mother is solid, she's 100%. And the father, the father is afflicted with doubts. The father is a selfish prick. Trish, honey, that bastard hung up on me twice. Whose signature is on the consent? Who we got? Now everyone is staring at me. We have both, I say. I have the file here. Edgewater will handle this, Rudy prophecies, staring right at me. Mr. Harkonnen needs to be reminded of why this is important. Life or death. I think he knows, Jim. I pitched him, too. Oh, yikes. Um, and I'm sure I told him about Dory. We'll tell him again, Edgewater. Rudy beams at me. Rudy's the kind of boss who goes from screaming to beaming in seconds flat at a psychopathic velocity. He's got to hear it from you face to face. Only a stone would refuse to donate after your pitch. Trish, baby, Edgewater. Pride heats my eyes. It's reprehensible, but that's what happens. I tell them that it might not work if he's that dead set against it. And Jim and Rudy pour it on even thicker, emphasizing that I am indispensable to the organizations, that the Corps would be lost without me, blah, blah, blah. Look at you, Rudy grins. Look at those hands, says Jim approvingly. So we look at my hands, which are shaking. And I feel proud again, which has got to be the wrong response to a set of involuntary tremors. My body knows what I'm about to do, and it's balking, just like Mr. Harkonnen. All right, I tell them. You are the genuine article, Trish. You're simply, I said I'll go, Rudy. Rudy is a bad recruiter. 
I've seen him in action. Potential donors sway on the brink of a yes, prepared to surrender to the gravity of the appeal, and Rudy gets overzealous. Rudy turns the solicitation into a game of coercion, and at last his lip-smacking anticipation of their gift makes people wary again, and they stiffen up into a no. That's how we got Baby A, you know, Jim loud whispers to the intern, Sam Yoon, a college junior in a mint green dress shirt who is earnestly frowning as I exit the trailer. It's a whisper that I know I'm meant to hear. Trish pitched Mr. Harkonnen at a sleep drive in a parking lot, nabbed her right outside the grocery store, schlepping Baby A. Watch her pitch sometime, shadow her at a drive. She's pure appeal, pure passion for the cause. Her sister was Dory Edgewater. Oh my, says the intern, exactly matching Rudy's tone. What distinguishes me as a recruiter, I'm told by Rudy and Jim, is that my sister's death is evergreen for me, a pure shock, the freshest outrage and I don't have to dig around with the needle. That vein is open on the surface. Trish can't fake it. She cries every time. She quakes like. She gets emotional and the people respond. She sobs like she's still at the wake. Then Jim frowns, self-startled. He is a mid-sentence self-startler, my boss. Hiccups of insight, he calls these moments. Whenever he is struck dumb by his own epiphanic inner light, I picture a tiny deer jolted out of its grazing with grass in its mouth paralyzed by the brilliant approach of a Mack truck. <laughs> Wait a sec, Rudy. Why the hell do we call it that? Awake. Awake? For a dead gal? Well, that's terrible. That's goddamn macabre. That was deliberately mispronounced. Sorry, <laughs> I just I was like, don't worry, guys. <laughs> uh, I've wondered that myself. Seems a pretty grim joke. Oh, there's definitely a reason, says the brown-nosing intern. It's some Catholic logic, or perhaps it's a Jews thing. People respond, bellows Rudy. Edgewater, she's a little engine. Even our most resistant demographics give to her. Males, retirees, Greenwich bankers, West Texas construction workers. Of course, the intern nods. They have no immunity to Edgewater's story. I'm hovering near the trailer door, holding my breath. They keep talking, and I listen. I desperately need what they're offering a faith transfusion, the why and the how of our organization, our work and its value. In high school, the Red Cross blood truck would pull up behind the trailers to collect donations from young Hale students who got to skip homeroom and eat a raisin cookie and then relinquish pints of typo. Dory gave, but I never did. I convinced myself that I was scared of needles. Didn't you guys have that? There was always like some kid passing out because he would just skip all the periods to give blood. If I'd known then that I'd wind up here begging strangers for an hour of their sleep, I think I would have given blood at every opportunity. As a core volunteer, my duties are numerous and varied. Weekends, I mobilize the sleep van, a moonlit enterprise that dispatches a volunteer team to the homes of good sleepers who have signed up to donate their rest to insomniacs. A sleep van has a Spartan interior, the beds we call catch cots. If the van is equipped for infants and children, it features catch cribs and trundles. Nurses slip on the anesthetic mask, open the IV of special chemicals, relieving a donor of consciousness. Next, they clamp on and adjust the silver helmet, which does chafe a bit. One to two minutes after the loss of consciousness, once the donor enters a state of artificially stimulated ultrasleep, the draw commences. The air in the van turns balmy as the tubing heats, and a donor's dream moist breath gets siphoned into nozzles that connect to our tanks. Healthy sleep is pumped out of the bodies into long, clear tubes, and weeknights I recruit. We set up for sleep drives in neighborhoods all across the country right at sundown. Nurses swab out helmets in multiple vans, preparing to take donations for testing. Administrators sit inside lit tents on suburban lawns, holding clipboards, pre-screening donors with an eligi eligibility questionnaire to filter out those whose sleep is prone to nightmares, disturbance. We babble the questions to volunteers under the midnight pines. When was your last night of deep, unbroken sleep, ma'am? When did you last dream about barking dogs, outer space, red grass, an ex-wife? Now please be honest, sir. If your sleep was disturbed by her face, check the box. For most of the 21st century, insomnia was treated by prescription medicines, and I can still remember going with my father to pick up my sister's sleeping tablets from the owl-faced pharmacist. Capsules of Silenor, half white and half carnation pink. Dory's sleep trouble began early at age 11. Back then, before the disease progressed, 
medications reliably put her under. Uh-oh, guys, this has, like, never happened before. I think I have to take a sip of water. I'm sorry. I see people do this for effect, but this is not that. Um, uh, Dory's tro sleep trouble began early at age 11. I used to study my sister's face on the pillow, trying to catch the moment when the drugs rolled her under. Once her adolescent insomnia ratcheted up, for unknown reasons, into the full-blown illness, Dory slept about four hours a night. And for years, this was enough. The body can be a marvel of resiliency, a cactus when it comes to sleep, capable of surviving on mere drops. By 20, however, Dory had developed a resistance to all sleep aids, and she also began, quite suddenly, impossible to anesthetize. We learned this when she broke her leg in college and surgeons were forced to operate on a fully conscious Dory. That anesthesiologist is still writing papers about her. Her leg healed, but soon Dory lost the ability to sleep even three hours a night. She could not stay down long enough to cycle into REM. She had to drop out of college and move into a hospital room. What didn't they try on her? Dexmedifine, propofol, sevoflurane, and xenon. The trank gun used to bring down zoo elephants would have stopped her heart, or I'm certain the doctors would have given that a go. Nobody could shade or muzzle her mind. For the next year, Dory barely slept, and then the loss became total. The final day of my sister's life unwound with zero regard for the moon or the sun, and she died awake after 20 days, 11 hours, and 14 minutes without sleep, locked flightlessly inside her skull. You know, as an adolescent, I used to seethe with jealousy because whereas I got auburn stubs, Dory had these fringed butterfly eyes, jet lashes that curled so outrageously around her Caribbean green irises that strangers assumed were drugstore falsies. During her endless last day, I remember studying those eyelashes pasted to her skin at an angle of unrelieved attention. She blinked at me, her thinking slow as syrup, and I wished that she would not smile again. Not ever again, not like that. Because by that point, every smile was an accident, a twitch driven by nothing that I recognized as human. My mouthy, gorgeous, stupid, brave sister Dory, Miss Drive It Like You Stole It, even when the only available it was our great aunt's haunted house of a wood-paneled Chrysler. Who ever heard of a car with termites? <laughs> Miss Three Jobs, Two College Majors, and There's a Flask in My Purse. She was at this point a nobody, a vegetable, as they like to say, the doctor's potted plant. And I hated the sight of her facial muscles, pumpkin grinning on the pillow, and her pale eyes twitching. And I hated watching her go speechless under the conglomerate weight of so much unrelenting looking and thinking and listening and feeling, her mind worn thin by the sound of every cough and the plinking moisture of every raindrop, these noises exploding like grenades through her naked awareness and her mind crushed in the end by an avalanche of waking minutes. Once sleep stopped melting time for Dory, she could not dig herself out and she was buried under snowflakes, minutes to hours to months. The official cause of death was organ failure. And I know it doesn't sound like much on paper. Um, let's skip just a tiny bit. What triggers the dysfunction in some brains as opposed to others? Do these people have some inherited anomaly, an underlying genetic predisposition to wakefulness, a higher wattage consciousness, or is the trigger environmental? Nobody knows. That's the $2 billion question. To date, every known case of the disruption has occurred in the Americas, and nobody knows why this should be so either. Some speculate that the sickness is connected to the ocean's tides, magnetism, the poles, the hemispheres, the net of light and shadow on the globe. And other pundits promise, with weird relish, that we are seeing the end of sleep as we know it. TV has become a glum hall of prophets. Dr. Devisha Frank from the Boston Sleep Tank, who speaks like a robot program to self-destruct. Dower professors wearing sunflower yellow ties that film well. According to these professional Cassandras, sleep has been chased off the globe by our 24-hour news cycle, our polluted skies and crops and waterways, the bald eyeballs of our glowing devices. We Americans are sitting in an electric chair that we engineered. What becomes of our circadian rhythms, the old glad harmonies that leapt through us like the vascular thrust of water through leaves of grass? Bummer news, Walt. That song's done. 
and the endogenous clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, hereditary prize of every human, that tiny star cluster of neurons in the hypothalamus which regulates our yawning appetites for hard winter light and spacey blackness. The master clock that sinks us to one another and to the Earth's rotation, the sun and the moon, to all the sister kingdoms on the 24-hour circuit. Bacteria, Gila monsters, great sequoias, blue whales, orange groves, bear cubs, mustangs, toadstools, leopards, golden eagles, hyacinths, hippopotami, those tiny wizards, the butterflies, those glue artists, the arachnids, and all the sequin life on the seafloor, the black urchins that improbably still clock time with us. Bummer news, everybody. The clock stops for humanity. Time itself, they say, will soon become an anachronism. Time as our species has lived it on this planet will cease to exist. No more dark light binary, no more active red daytime, blue evening dissolving. No longer is sunshine the coagulant of consciousness, causing us to clot into personalities and cohere once more on our pillows each morning. Nope, these TV scientists predict a global desertification of dreams. Soon they promise the disruption will afflict all of us, sleep will go extinct, and eventually, unless we can find some way to synthesize it, so will we. Now look, generally I'm mistrustful of these warblers who do the dread crescendo. But I'm embarrassed to report that the slumber corps has borrowed a page from their playbook, Eschatological Manipulation. At Sleep Drives in Alabama, Georgia, and Florida, we are test screening a documentary created by those ratings whores. The worst of the cable news fear lords is sleep going extinct. And I'm afraid to say it has been very effective. We show it at night like a popcorn horror flick. Terror, we've discovered, is a powerful donation stimulant. Um, I'm just going to skip to the pretty, pretty grim stuff. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so... Four months ago, I pitched Mrs. Harkonnen at a drive outside the Piggly Wiggly Grocery. I spotted a baby's face pinking out of her pretty woven papoose, and I introduced myself. Mrs. Harkonnen was an easy convert to the slumber corps, crying freely at my sister's death story. The baby witnessed our exchange with that eerie calm that babies have, dry-eyed and blank. Was her husband with her? No. Could I arrange to get his signature? To dispatch a sleep van, we'd need both parents' consent. One week later, I paid a visit to 330 Cedar Ridge Parkway to collect the consents. Mrs. Harkonnen greeted me on the porch with a shy smile. Her hands starfished out in front of her. The nail polish was wet. She'd remembered my name. Trish, come on in. She'd put on red lipstick and was ready with a pot of decaf. Upstairs, the baby was crying, and we'd both smiled automatically at the sound. My husband's with her. He signed your papers. She pushed over the consent, and I saw that Felix Harkonnen's autograph was freshly inked. He's a little worried about the procedure. She's our first, you know, and he's a very protective father. The note of apology in her voice unnerved me a little. This was perhaps my first intimation that Mrs. Harkonnen was a very special sort of donor. I'd never met a mother like this, for whom the gift of a daughter's sleep seemed so matter-of-fact. Why did she assume, I wondered, that her husband's reluctance needed explanation. But I told Felix about all those poor people on the list, why this donation is so important to them, a life serum. Then she'd paused and stared intently at me, and I saw that I'd been wrong to think this woman was in any way naive. There was some shrewdness alive inside her kindness, a perspicacity that thrilled and frightened me that I did not understand. This quality of Mrs. Harkonnen's attentiveness caused my whole body to prickle, as if invisible quills were lifting under my skin. This was a surprise. For the past eight months, I'd felt brain dead and nerve dead when I was not recruiting. I'd stumbled around in a daze during the periods between our sleep drives, those jagged white intervals of time, which I had formerly experienced as a unity, a day. Your sister, I can't stop thinking about her. Oh? So I'd stared up at the unshaded bulb above the Harkonnen kitchen table. Gravity, I found, can be exploited in these situations. Moisture slid back into my pupils. A swimmy seepage of green light contracted back inside the bulb, and I did not cry. Once the kitchen went mad again, I was able to meet her eyes. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for keeping her in mind. My sister would be here today if we'd had Gould's technology. 
Then my voice broke and I had to really work to keep my grin from stretching into something crooked and hungry, and my eyes felt dish-sized, much too large for my face. Ordinarily, I only resurrect my sister during a pitch. That's where I feel her. But that night I was certain that I sensed my sister's presence in the stranger's kitchen, or almost certain. I badly wanted to see you, Dory, as you existed for Mrs. Harkonnen. Typically, my recruits receive the story of my sister's death day with a mixture of sympathy and horror, and many people give sleep as a kind of frightened oblation, a way to sandbag their healthy lives from my sister's fate. If she works on them, they respond with a donation. But all most people ever really know about my sister is how she died. My smile became natural in response to Mrs. Harkonnen's smile, and she offered me a reheat on the black coffee, cream and sugar, Mrs. Harkonnen was the kindest and gentlest inquisitor I had ever met. Somehow, she intuited everything I could not say about Dory, and she asked me only questions to which I possessed factual answers. And I heard myself telling stories from our Pennsylvania childhood, these shadowy green memories of Dory that I'd never shared with anyone. All this time, the baby had been wailing. At first, I'd been astonished by her volume. Once Mrs. Harkonnen got me talking about Dory, however, I'd stop noticing. Then that pour of solar sound cut out. The infant's silence was, la was louder than her screams had been. We turned from the forms together, and there was the father, Mr. Harkonnen. He was standing at the top of the stairwell, holding the baby. I've changed my mind, he said. I stood, and so did Mrs. Harkonnen. Sit down, Mrs. Harkonnen commanded me, suddenly steely. Felix, we've made a promise to these people. Then I went perfectly still in their kitchen, holding chilly coffee forgotten completely, recruiting people to a cause I found often isolates you in strange spandrels, caught between a stranger's intersecting planes of aversion and desire. In the case of the Harkonnens, I was a literal trespasser. Wait here, said the red-eyed Mrs. Harkonnen, smiling sheepishly at me, as if she needed only check on, oh no, <laughs> something burning, <laughs> something burning in the oven. Oh man, guys, it's like the last paragraph. My phone's ringing. This is a disaster. Hold on one second. It's because the, the timer's done. That's why that's happening. All right. People, the, the winds of time are trying to get in. Um, insomnia itself wants to, wants to make a... All right, wait here, said the red-eyed Mrs. Harkonnen, smiling sheepishly at me, as if she need only check on something burning in the oven. I eavesdropped on Mrs. Harkonnen, woodpecker drilling into the stout oak of her husband. We're doing this, Felix. We have no choice. I won't be able to live with myself otherwise. And as they argued on the stairwell, I closed my eyes and I folded my hands on their table. And what I pictured was a great fire fanning out through the house and consuming every obstacle. It was more a wish than a picture, if we're honest. I willed the fire to eat a pathway to a yes. That night, I left 330 Cedar Parkway with two signatures. Four nights later, I dispatched a sleep van to take the dreams from their daughter. Thank you. That's <laughs> yeah, Q&A, perfect. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I just didn't want to presume. <laughs> yeah. All right, so um, if you have a question, put your hand up, and um, Anna will bring the mic over to you so everyone can hear um, what it is you want to ask. Oh, yeah. Yeah, really, I know, in, in a language that <laughs> don't translate it, anybody, I don't want to answer. <laughs> I am blown away by you. I think you're an amazing writer. And That's so cool. I, I pay I, this woman. <laughs> <laughs> I like that she always starts it off. <laughs> oh my God! Thank you so I, much. I'm so I brought <laughs> my students to hear you, and I'm so glad that I did. And um, I'm just wondering. I mean, you seem like you were born writing. You know, like it seemed like she seems like an old soul or something that like popped out as a writer. <laughs> I wondered, like, what were your what were your first influences? That, that that's like the nicest you. question that's ever been asked. Also, now I can't picture it. You know, now I'm picturing just like, I don't know, like Ebenezer Scrooge ghost like popping out <laughs> and just some really disappointed mom. Um, that's such a kind. That's such a kind question. No, I'm. A, I mean, 
I, they were. We were talking about this before the reading, just how do you know you become a writer? And I was really blessed that I was not great at that, but really bad at most other verbs. So that, you know, kind of sets you up. And I, um, I just was reading all the time. I mean, I think I, I still think of myself primarily as a reader, and then I, you try to do this too. But I, uh, I felt like I lived all of my real life between pages. You know, that was really where... Um, it was just, I was, I truly think I was such an anxious kid and our house was kind of an anxious place. So it was being able to dissolve into this other space, you know, where in one way the stakes were reduced, but in another way you could actually confront what's truly terrifying and mysterious about being alive, you know, and, and live in, you know, I just felt like the real feeling and thinking I was doing was not happening in skin. It was happening inside these books, um, you know, annexed to some other mind or consciousness. So I, I just I feel like that's probably true for most writers, right? That you start out as just a super bookworm, just uh, and some people. It's always amazing to me when people don't need that. You know, I have some really good friends who aren't readers, and it's just I can't. It's like oxygen or something. I'm like, but then how would you even know what you think or feel? You know, it's very mysterious to me. I'm like, what do you, what do you do with all that time? You know, I, um, probably probably plenty, um, but uh. So my early influences were, you know, Madeline Langley. Like, I think two roads diverge in the woods sometimes for YA readers, and there's sort of these, they're, they're books that resemble the life that you're leading, and then there's something exciting about reading about, you know, other, others of your cohort. What I, Nancy Drew, right, solving mysteries or, you know, discovering that kind of power. And then there's just, I was always sort of Ray Bradbury, you know, let's, let's put our elf ears on and go down into the mines. Let's, you know, let's go to the planet Dune. I mean, I think I was like, how far, let's set the GPS to far from here <laughs> and elsewhere. Um, so those were really, we, Claire and I, it turns out, have a book in common, The Day of the Triffids, which is the most amazing sci-fi book where there's a comet, turns the whole world blind, except for, you know, some slender percentage of people who are very popular in the new world. Um, and, and also plants that these plants sort of opportunistic plants choose that moment to reveal that there are slave overlords, you know, so. Um, so I have to say, too, so it's just kind of a backwards education, too, right, because I remember finally getting to high school and learning about World War II, having done all of Tolkien, and you sort of have some dim awareness. I'm like, this all sounds familiar. Um, so just sort of backwards references. And Florida, I just think the geography of Florida I just feel like, I mean, come on. Yeah, I always feel like the literary influences came later because you're looking for a way to understand Miami, you know, or, or Florida, which is where I, I grew up. So, thank you. No, oh, thank you for coming. No, 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 no. Oh, sure. I mean, and you don't have to look look far, right? I think this was an interesting one, this novella for me, because it really was fed by a lot of, you know, um, just a real, I have a real interest in this vertiginous way that we're living right now, where sort of our rhythms are being altered and everyone is implicated in everyone's life online. And that just seems like such a unique moment, you know, where kind of the day night binary really is breaking down in a lot of ways. And there's this, the velocity that an idea can travel, you know. Um, I just think it's wild to try to find some place to think about what that might mean for us. I mean, I. I doubt, you know, I don't think there's going to be an insomnia crisis anytime soon, but just to be living as a collective in this way, it's, it's, a, it's a wild thing. So sometimes it'll be that kind of preoccupation that I wouldn't even know how to think through it kind of out loud, right? It has to find some narrative home or vessel or whatever. My sister sent me an email where she's like, dear sister, please stop writing about sisters. Love your sister. <laughs> so, um... So it's true, like none of, I, I'm, they're always, my siblings, I have two amazing siblings and they're always keen for me to say that none of this is autobiographical and I'm sure that it's not on the literal level, you know, or on the, the plot level, but just, you're always extrapolating from what you know, right? So I, I think that kind of, how love makes you vulnerable, you know, and what, what law, you know, all, all that stuff. Uh, but I was, I was saying earlier, I always start off thinking I'm gonna write this like hilarious, just like a, you know, like a Will Ferrell sketch or something. Um, so I wrote this story about these girls raised by wolves, and I was like, ha-ha, I'm going to be laughing 
laughing all the way to the bank. And then it just became very, you know, hopefully, you know, if, if it works out well, then it's a way to think about, for me, for me, this is, you know, a, a different question. Um, so I don't know if that answers that. Okay. I think a lot of, uh, a lot of these stories started as just like goofy what ifs for me. So I wrote this story about a vampire in a lemon grove. We happened to be in a lemon grove and there was this very tan man who had jammed a lemon in his mouth and he looked like a tan vampire to me. I was with these siblings I just mentioned. I was like, look, that must be like vampire methadone. That's how he's outside. And they're like, you are dumb. Let's go back to like, <laughs> where's the bar? So they have pretty humble origins. Um. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, poetry for fi people who are fiction writers, that was the best class I took as an undergrad, I think, it was a poetry class. Because you learn how suspense works on the level of the line, and you learn about like the friction between words, and I didn't want to do that at all, because poetry was taught to me as this sort of like inscrutable riddle, you know, like dissect the beating heart of the poem in 45 minutes or you fail, and that just seemed too high stakes, and um, you know, nobody was saying, giving you permission to love what was mysterious about a poem. It was like you were dumb if there was any anything ineffable or inarticulable about them. So I love Dean Young. I don't know if you guys read him. He's amazing. Dean Young, Maureen McLean, um, Wallace Stevens. A friend of mine was like, oh, I love Wallace Stevens, but everybody does. I was like, that's not true. <laughs> Our people do. Like, it, you know, um, Ann Carson. I don't know if you guys have read. She has a novel in verse called The Autobiography of Red, which is truly so beautiful. Um, who, uh, Kevin Young, I love Kevin Young stuff. Um, Tracy K. Smith, these are kind of some contemporary folks. Manly Hopkins, just, yeah, gong in those syllables, love him. This like, uh, George Herbert, you know, he does, he's, everyone has to read Easter Wings at some point, but he's, I just think he's extraordinary. Um, I, I, could, I could go on, I don't know. Yeah, but I do, I think it's, it's, it's great to, to read poetry. Yeah. Ah, oh, that's a great question. It really varies. I think it really varies, but oftentimes the I think the best writing or the writing that I'm happiest with will come it'll be like a strange aside. So I will, I'll, 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 the worst writing I do is when I will like sort of develop a theory about the story I'm writing early on and then move in a sort of, you know, lockstep, like a lockstep allegory, like some kind of tidy one-to-one. -one. And then it's, all, it's often a disaster. It's just there, there's nothing mysterious about it to me. So why would I expect a, a reader would be surprised? Um, so sometimes it is sort of like a woolly digression that will reveal which, what the actual interesting question is, the open question. Um, sometimes a woolly digression is 50 pages with like a drunk grandpa that needs to be cut. So it really, I mean, not to advocate for total screed or anything. Um, but um, yeah, and I love even late, late into revision, right? You can still sort of, uh, I think at a certain point, Francis Cody was like, no more bubbling. We're <laughs> we've got to, um, you know, get this moving. But I do, I do think there's never a stage of writing where you're not, there might not still be something kind of some tectonics that want to push up, you know, a new scene or a new, a new better uh, metaphoric capture or something. All right. Well, those are all the questions we had time for. Okay. Uh, please join me in thanking Thank Karen so Russell for, coming, for such guys. a wonderful reading. Real books on sale at the That's back. And uh, thank you.